few minutes. It's fabulous to be with you this morning. Now, a few minutes ago, we heard from Lauren Fox from Tyres, who's deaf. Maxine Buxton is the General Manager of Deaf Victoria, and she joins me now. Good morning. Good morning, Beck. Um, what a lovely song that was. Beautiful. Mm. Now, Lauren mentioned some problems deaf people have faced over the past few months with COVID. But what else has been apparent for you in the deaf community? Well, I think it's been a really interesting time, as both you and Lauren highlighted, particularly in terms of the increase in prevalence of access for deaf community members to information in Auslan, so interpreters at press conferences and that kind of thing. But I guess for us in the deaf sector, it's really puzzling that uh, this idea that deaf people need access to information so that they can make informed decisions and so that they can be active citizens is really only occurring during times of emergencies and that what we would really like to see is more information in Auslan all of the time so that deaf people can activate their citizenship all of the time, not just uh, in times of emergency. So that's been really, really interesting. So what about, you know, just in general on TV, um, you know, with just watching everyday TV, would deaf people generally use closed captions to be able to watch it? I think uh, in Australia, the, the amount of television programs that have captioning is quite low, so it's not like a lot of other countries where there's a high percentage uh, of, of shows that must be closed captioned. So not all shows are captioned, and a lot of streaming services also don't caption uh, television shows. And if you've ever watched live captions, particularly during uh, a news broadcast, they can be ridiculously uh, erroneous, with mm. even with the, you know, the best quality captioners. Um, and I guess the other thing there is that for a lot of deaf people, English is their second language. So they much prefer to get information in their first language, which is Auslan. So, you know, I have a basic level of understanding in Spanish, but I am much more comfortable getting information in English, not reading Spanish uh, captions. So that's why it's more important to have Auslan interpreters on the TV rather than just relying on reading it. Yeah, and captions also don't necessarily show tone or severity, um, whereas interpreters can do all of that. And you, you see interpreters and in how expressive they are. Um, and using facial expression and body language in that way is an integral part of Auslan to show tone, to show how we use spoken language and, and we stress particular words or we make particular language choices. And that's all conveyed with an interpretation. But in captions, it's not necessarily all there. Now, people in Melbourne are being asked to wear masks uh, when they leave the house, go to the supermarket, things like that, because they're in the stage three lockdown restrictions. In Gippsland, we're not quite there yet. Um, but what would you like to see in terms of masks or protection for people uh, so they can communicate with deaf people? Yeah, look, it's been, um, I guess, interesting. Just in the last couple of days, Deaf Victoria has been contacted by a lot of deaf people who are working on the ground and are concerned about this rollout of face masks and how it's going to inhibit their ability to communicate on a daily basis. So we've had people contacting us that might work in healthcare or um, nursing homes who are deaf themselves. So their concern is if uh, other people in the homes are wearing the face masks, then they're not going to be able to lip read, they won't be able to see facial expressions. So it's a, it's a big concern and I guess there's that added stress on, on the deaf community during these times of crisis that they might not be able to get access to the, the correct information that they need and this is another layer. Overseas we've seen um, a lot of people started making face masks with little clear panels on them um, and I've been desperately trying to find an Australian supplier, preferably someone who's deaf, so that we can sort of support the deaf economy, if you like. Um, but, yeah, that's something we're definitely going to try and work on. Would those um, plastic face shields be a better option in terms of, I mean, even when you have got a face mask on, you're, and if you did have a clear panel, your jaw movement is still relatively limited. Do you think maybe one of those, you know, the big face shields would be better? Yeah, look, I mean, I think in terms of what would um, be more 
uh, easily accessible and more pleasing to look at is one thing, but then obviously there's health considerations and I'm not a health professional. So, mm. you know, th there's pros and cons, I guess, to using both and, and the messaging from government is that masks will help um, both stop, in, you know, you, you getting the disease or, or you spreading the virus if, if you're asymptomatic. So, uh, you know, we need to be really cognizant of that and take that on board, but it's just about, well, what a... What a adaptations can we make so that we're still following government guidelines but um, allowing some better access to the people that do rely on facial expression and the reading. So what could the government do better at this point? Look, I think there's been uh, definitely an increase in understanding by government departments and, and health departments on how important it is that not just deaf community members but there's also a lot of talk of government about other minority or other language groups and how it's really important that they get not just translation, but the government actually engages with those community groups, finds community leaders, and then asks them to adapt the government messaging in a culturally and linguistically appropriate way for their community. And we've seen that happening a lot. Um, and I guess so for us in the deaf community, having interpreters at press conferences are great and it was something that we really think should be at any press conference because deaf people have the right to all kinds of information. But also, I guess what we'd like to see is government meaningfully engaging with groups um, that provide interpreting services and services for deaf people so that they can also be supported to craft messages that are appropriate for the deaf community, not just interpreters, because that's really that's just one part of the puzzle. And just lastly, how could we in society be better allies for people in the deaf community? Well, that's a tricky question for me. I, I'm not deaf myself, but, but I hope that um, I am an ally for the deaf community. I guess that like any um, disability community, there's a, a quite a, a, a well-used phrase, which is nothing about us without us. So when we're talking about deaf people, when we're considering their needs, we actually engage with deaf people and ask them, what do you want? What will work for you? And a, a really prime example of that is after this interview, we're going to do some work in the background to make sure we get a full transcript of it, mm. to make it accessible to the deaf community because often people talk on radio, on television about deaf and hard of hearing people and then go and share the interview on Facebook and it's not accessible. It doesn't have captions. So I think... You know, just engaging with deaf people and, and listening to what their access needs are and um, how, how we can best support them is, is the best way to do it. Mm. And look, I have to say, just before you go, it, it was a really um, interesting and insightful experience to interview Lauren because it was the first uh, interview I had done via Zoom, so via video conferencing with an interpreter and a person who is deaf. Um, but it was a great experience as well. And, yeah, I do look forward... Uh, I might cringe when I look at myself in that video, but <laughs> I do look forward to seeing it and, um, yeah, and reading that uh, transcript as well. Look, thank you very much for your time this morning, Maxine Buxton. It's a pleasure. And I just say, Bex, that thank you for being open to it and for listening to what worked for, for Lauren and the interpreter. And, you know, that's how you're a good ally. You just listen and you learn and you improve and make mistakes along the way and get up and try again tomorrow. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Maxine Buxton is the General Manager of Deaf Victoria, talking about what life has been like for people in the deaf community uh, during COVID and what we can do better. And earlier we spoke to Lauren Fox from Tyres, who's deaf, about her experiences, which was quite interesting to hear. Backbeat with Bex